The National Symposium on the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. proudly presents Harold Weisberg's seminar on recent developments in the John F. Kennedy assassination. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Weisberg who will be speaking on uh, recent developments, the Schweiger Report, Abzug Report, FBI revelations, etc. So at this time I'd like to inter introduce the man who in his modesty has only sued the government nine times, Mr. Harold Weisberg. In the course of time, Jim and I are going to get less modest. There have been many developments, and it's not too easy to put them all into a complete context, but you have force and you have counterforce. And before we go into some of the new developments, uh, I'd like to look into the crystal ball that's blinding me and tell you to expect more developments after the first of the year because the time has come when the executive agencies who as those of you who have been in attendance in these symposiums for this week I think pretty clearly understand now these executive agencies have very much to lose by an honest investigation. This of course introduces what we're talking about this morning how they've coped with them in the past and they have coped with them in the past. Dr. Rohn's going to be talking about some aspect of it later today. They coped uh, with Senator Schweiger, for example, in a very effective way. Uh, you know what happened to the Pike Committee, and those of you who followed the Church Committee closely uh, know that it, it made a lot of headlines, but we got the same people doing the same kind of business in the same way. No basic changes. The bureaucracies persist. It's the nature of all bureaucracies. And the bureaucracy of the intelligence agencies uh, persist more successfully because they got the stuff with everybody else. The Schweiker report, which I mentioned briefly last night, is a classic example of the success of government disinformation operations. It's not new. Those of us who follow these things closely, for example, I mentioned the Watergate Committee, uh, frequently learn a fair amount of what these committees do not want to bring to light. There was no real Watergate investigation. There was just enough to get rid of Richard Nixon. If you stop and think, one of my problems, and I hope you can understand it, is that there there is an enormous amount of information and I, I just don't know if I cut off too soon if I'm informing you enough. So please interrupt me if I am not clear because while I want to be fully informative I also want to cover quite much and I hope you can understand the problem I have. Uh, I'll try and, and, and give you one simple illustration with the Watergate Committee which everybody just loved. Once the word about Nixon's tapes was out, there was not a single bit of investigation. You think back over the newspaper headlines, over what you saw on TV, especially if you took in the hearings when they were live, nothing. Nobody investigated anything. There was much that could have been learned by investigation, an enormous amount that could not possibly have been on those tapes. <coughs> All governments, as I think you've come to know, work under pressures. They're political pressures. There were great pressures, some of which I indicated last night, on those who remained in government and the new president once John Kennedy was killed. These pressures never wear off. They are of all kinds of sources, uh, for all kinds of reasons, and they're not all bad reasons. It depends on the uh, question of concern on the subject matter, uh, what form the pressures can take, how normal they are, and things of that sort. I don't know why Dick Schweiker wanted to have a, 
a subcommittee of the Church Committee on Political Assassinations. There were other members of the committee who knew me, who asked me to come in and speak to them long before there was a Schweiker committee. And from his total indifference to the work of the subcommittee, I have no idea why Senator Gary Hart, who you may remember was George McGovern's campaign manager, um, wanted to be on the subcommittee. His attitude was negative about anything, everything. And he apparently did absolutely no work at all. So I can't explain that to you. Uh, I can tell you that in the meeting I had with Dick Schweiker when he asked me to come in, and it's a day I'll never forget because I was on my way to the hospital and I didn't know it, uh, I was much impressed by the man. But I, I developed a theory that uh, he had heard the siren song and found it melodious. And I tried to caution him against theorizing, and I tried to persuade him that the last thing the country needs is new trauma, that we have a sufficient agony, and that theorizing would just mean more agony, and he thanked me profusely, and I really left there impressed, uh, impressed with the idea that he might go and take a responsible road, as I'd outlined it to him. And while I was in the hospital, I heard news accounts of his appearance in his native state of Pennsylvania, and my faith didn't last long. He was off on the theory, on the theory kick. And it's in his report. Another example of the pressure, I'm going to come back and spend most of the time on the Schweiker report, uh, is uh, of a subcommittee with a very colorful leader, uh, also known as chairperson, Congresswoman Bella Absug. Uh, She's a spunky gal, everybody thinks, isn't she? You, you agree? The image she projects, she's tough, nothing going to stop her. She got stopped. She had the pressure. It came from the top administration of the House. And how did she react to pressure, as tough as Bill is? Well, she wanted to be senator. There was a limit to how far she could go in alienating her party. She had a proper reason to look into things because she was the chairperson of an administrative practices subcommittee that had jurisdiction over freedom of information. Fact is, her staff director drove me to the hospital so we could talk over what they would go into. And they were quite excited. I was in the hospital. They wanted Jim, who was a legitimate expert on the law, to testify. Jim stopped everything and prepared a long statement. And then they came to the hearings. And when they were going to call Jim, she banged the gavel. And they didn't call Jim. They finally put the statement he had prepared in the record. But that's good for only those who read it. It's not good for those who attended the hearings. If there was any news coverage of the hearings, it was automatically precluded. And I just two, three weeks ago found out <clears throat> how the pressure was applied. The pressure was applied by the congressman from Texas, who was the chairman of the main committee, of which hers was a subcommittee. Uh, I told you last night, and I'm going to have to repeat again today, that uh, I forgot to follow up on these records that I want you all to have that are being Xeroxed. These that Dr. Roan just retrieved had not yet been Xeroxed, and I forgot to tell him one. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead uh, to tell you this story because it's relevant to the ABSUG subcommittee as is relevant to other things. It's relevant to what we were talking about last night, uh, the Commission's practices of suppressing, and to what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, the actualities of what they suppressed. Here are the documents. I had a chapter of the book that finally appeared as a frame-up written that had to be edited out, and I call it the Dick Rubbers. It's in quotation marks. If you will look in your library copy of the Warren Commission 26 volumes in the table of contents in the front of each volume and look for Exhibit 710, you will find a listing of the exhibit and a footnote. And the bottom of the page, you will find a footnote saying there is no such exhibit. Well, there is. And it was entered into evidence. And if you go through the volumes of testimony, you will find where it is entered into evidence. 
This is something the ABSA committee wanted, so I gave it to him. I have it. It's one of a series of intelligence agency of the police, in this case, intelligence unit reports, of what their agents were telling him. <clears throat> and the young Republicans at uh, Texas State University at Denton, Texas, which is not far from Dallas, uh, were planning an unusual reception for the president. It was taken as a threat against his life, and that was not unreasonable. They said that when he come in this private meeting, when he comes to Dallas, we will rub his dick in the dirt. Uh, Mrs. Abzug wanted that. I gave my only copy. It took me almost a year to get it back. And they never used it. Now, this is self-suppression, isn't it? Uh, reacting to the pressures, because certainly if there's any member of the legislature who has at least the reputation of being a straightforward person, it's Bella Absig. This is what the pressures can do. And I pick her as an example because of her reputation, uh, because I'd like you to be considerate of the problems uh, that people in public life have. It's not all one way. They do have survival problems, and we're, of course, paying for them. Schweiker had a different kind of pressure. Schweiker's pressure was often inside Dick, Dick Schweiker. It took me some time to realize it. And when I did, I wrote him a letter, and it was a letter in which I, with uh, vigor that I don't find difficulty summoning, expressed my disappointment, saying that his longing to be Mr. Ford's vice presidential candidate uh, superseded his sense of obligations to the uh, responsibility he had sought. He replied uh, under date of about July 3rd of last year, I'm sorry, of, of this year, and uh, he told me he didn't deny this at all. He said, uh, if I have to make a choice between Mr. Reagan and Mr. Ford, I have no problems. I have to choose Mr. Ford. So two weeks later, he became Mr. Reagan's vice presidential candidate. This is a kind of pressure that is very real in political life. It, uh, it can be taken, of course, as a sordid thing, but you don't have to, and I don't think it really is. Uh, the political animal loves to get ahead, and he always tells himself that he's getting ahead just to serve the public interest and need. So. What I'm telling you is that the Schweiker report was written for all practical purposes as a campaign document and Gerald Ford's hope uh, uh, of becoming an elected president. And I'm going to go into some of the specifics. Unfortunately, they're going to have to be ad lib because, as you can see, I just got the records back. <clears throat> the report opens with a disclaimer that everybody, without exception, in the press paid no attention to. I'm sorry I couldn't bring a copy of it with me, but I invite you to read the exact language in the report. <clears throat> I'm sure you'll find it in your library. It's under the scope of the investigation, and the Schweiker report begins by saying, we are not considering what the Warren Commission did. We are not looking at their evidence. Uh, things of that sort. What he didn't say is we're not looking at the evidence they didn't have because I offered Senator Schweiker everything that is in post-mortem, uh, which then had not been printed. I offered to take a total loss on the cost of printing that book. The book was on the presses just so he, as a public servant, uh, could have those documents and use them responsibly. He did have them. He made no mention of them. And those of you who were present last night, I would like you to bear in mind the language I read you from the January 22nd report showing that the Warren Commission members knew that the FBI was holding back evidence relating to whether or not there was a conspiracy and whether or not uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had had complicating official connections. Last night we talked about the lack of innocence on the part of the committee, the commission, the Warren Commission. Dick Rubber's exhibit is a different kind of example. Uh, there were other records that I had intended to read, uh, but you'll be able to have access to them here. 
There's some under the title of Information Breakdown. Uh, now, these are some Warren Commission staff reports in which the staff had caught the FBI holding back before the commission held the first hearing. So they had a meeting with Mr. Malley, who was the FBI's liaison, and he encouraged the commission not to ask embarrassing questions because he said it would waste too much time of the FBI and take them away from their essential work, uh, including their essential work for the Warren Commission. Now, you should understand what, from the FBI's point of view, their essential work for the Warren Commission was. It was hopelessly flooding them with the irrelevant. The most elaborate single scientific examination made by the FBI for the Warren Commission was of Lee Harvey Oswald's pubic hairs. And if you look at the Warren report, you will find a page of the most detailed cross-sections and great enlargement proving that Oswald's pubic hairs were Oswald's pubic hairs. And the commission just oohed and odd over this, and they were so overwhelmed that they actually reproduced the FBI charts, drawings, and facsimile. They, what they did, actually, was to uh, vacuum a blanket that everybody in the world knew was Lee Harvey Oswald, and they got some hair off of it. And then they decided, by a science that is well known today, that these were pubic hairs. So they went to the jail, and they separated Oswald from some of his, and they made a comparison, and lo, they were Lee Harvey Oswald's pubic hairs. Well, I don't know who should care whose pubic hairs were on Lee Harvey Oswald's blanket except his wife. But the FBI and the Warren Commission made much of it, and we're getting again to how these investigations are misled. I'll be giving you more examples from Schweiker, and how they become disinformation operations, and how the spookeries, as I call them, and lump them all in with that, uh, <clears throat> tend to build up a mystique about themselves with the uncritical. Nobody stopped to ask who cares whose pubic hairs they already have to do with killing John Kennedy. The Schweiker report uh, followed an earlier investigation of which I want to make brief reference, and I think probably I'll be coming back to it again. But you remember, may remember that there was an investigation by a congressman, Don Edwards of California. You may have seen him on TV in the uh, House impeachment investigation. He was a member of that committee. Uh, congressman Edwards was interested in the story that had achieved uh, wide attention, thanks to CBS rehashing the story. Uh, of a man who had been an FBI clerk in New Orleans and who, in, as I remember it, uh, 1968, uh, said that he had seen a teletype uh, reporting a threat to kill the president. The 1975 and 1976 stories bear little resemblance to the original story. And this, this represents one of the traps that these committees can have from our side. I'll tell you the story of that Walter report. Mark Lane was making a speech at Tulane University in New Orleans, and after the speech, Walter came up to him and told him that he'd seen this teletype. It was on a weekend, and he was working nights. He was working his way through college as an FBI clerk. Well, Mark went and told Jim Garrison, and Jim, of course, knows more about everything than anybody. So he listened to this story. He said, I know exactly what that means. He said, that happens to be the weekend that nobody knows where Lee Harvey Oswald was, and it's obvious. Lee Harvey Oswald was performing his duty as an FBI informer to tell the FBI that people were going to kill John Kennedy when he came to Dallas. And that's what was on the teletype. Walter just doesn't remember it. And this is why we don't know where Oswald was. Well. Uh, I think the crystal ball blinded Jim Garrison a little bit more than that one blinding me. Then it got embellished even more, and this happens. It, it just does happen. So everybody lost sight of the reality. Had there been threats to kill John Kennedy at that time? If there had been threats, shouldn't the FBI have reported them and been on the alert? And of course they should have reported, and of course they should have been on the alert. It's a perfectly proper, it's an essential thing to do. Well, 
I know of three threats of that time period involving the National States Rights Party. There is one of which you will find the complete text and frame up in which there was a threat to kill both Dr. King and President Kennedy and it was taken so seriously by the Miami Police Department when they taped it on about November 9th just before the assassination that they told the Secret Service there just was not going to be any presidential motorcade when President Kennedy was there on November 19th to address the Inter-American Press Association and the Miami Police were quite right there shouldn't have been any motorcade so when the President landed in Air Force One he got on a helicopter and the chopper took him to where he made the speech and he made the speech and he got in the chopper and he left and he lived there was such a threat and there's more on that threat in uh, frame up uh, especially with relation to the King assassination which that book is about so this too was during the time frame when Walter says he saw a teletype so I think it's reasonable to believe that there had to be such a teletype and there'd been something wrong with the FBI if there hadn't been in fact there was nothing wrong with there being a teletype and everything right with there being one as a consequence of all of this obfuscation the FBI was able to deny every one of the manufacturers beginning with Mark Lane and Jim Garrison almost the night that Walter came up to uh, Mark after Mark spoke at Tulane this is the way from one side uh, these fictions that and, and these deceptions that are an, in, an indispensable part uh, of these new developments we're considering this morning work now from the other side uh, let me take another aspect of this uh, you may remember this it also involved Don Edwards and he also had egg on his face on coast to coast TV there was an FBI agent and he still is an FBI agent he was the first one disciplined by Hoover whose name is James Patrick Hostie Jr. he's an ultra conservative man he was the Oswald expert in the Dallas office he was in fact on their Red Squad <coughs> uh, their special agent in charge of the Dallas field office of the FBI at the time of the John Kennedy assassination was Gordon Shanklin he stayed there for a long time he retired last year as soon as his retirement was safe and secure there was a leak to the Dallas newspapers of what became a super sensational story that Lee Harvey Oswald had written a note to Hostie and that Hostie had destroyed it remember the headlines remember all the TV treatment well this got built up in the same manner as the Walter story got kicked around it got more sensationalized until finally there was a hearing now none of this was new I reported it in uh, at least my first three books it was testified to by two different people before the Warren Commission can you imagine it making such a sensation 12 years later but it did and it's a disinformation operation and it's one of the things that aborts these new efforts the FBI sent the man I referred to last night its expert in these matters one of Mr. Hoover's most proficient protégés James Adams he's the number three man in the FBI as of now and Adams testified before Don Edwards subcommittee and when he was finished uh, Mr. Edwards guts were spread out all over the table and Mr. Adams is a soft-spoken man who used no strong language at all but he eviscerated Don Edwards he referred to the fact that Marina Oswald had testified to her husband writing a note to Hostie and taking it to the FBI office he quoted the pages on which Ruth Payne the woman with whom the Oswalds lived Leone on weekends told the Warren Commission and the FBI the same thing and he said what's new well he said we investigated and their investigation began after the leak to the papers you can decide from this uh, since I don't know why there was such a leak here's what they did they went to a lot of trouble they spent a lot of your money and mine doing it they found everybody who had been in the Dallas FBI office at that time and interrogated every one of them and got every one of them to sign an affidavit 
And I, I'm sure that for the most part, these people were truthful. After 12 years, I'm sure that nobody had an absolutely certain recollection. So what evolved was two sharp areas of contradiction. For example, when was the note destroyed? Who told them to destroy it? How was it destroyed? Each one of these facts, every essential fact in the story, broke into two sharp areas of, of contradiction. You had between 25 and 50 people swearing each way. Now, under these circumstances, it's impossible to prove who's telling the truth, and it's impossible to charge anybody with perjury. Destruction of evidence, of course, is a serious thing. Well, I've told you part of what was lost in this, the fact that there was nothing new about it. Let me tell you the rest of it. That's not all Hosty destroyed. He destroyed everything. He destroyed every note he had. Now, he wasn't in any hurry to do it. He waited a month. And he wasn't anxious to keep it secret. He testified to it before the Warren Commission. <coughs> and they accepted it as the most normal thing in the world. Nobody said, what did you say? And as of now, there has been no investigation of any of what is essential. They, everybody went down the primrose path. And all the sensation about the leaking of the Hostie story in last year, there was no indignation because the FBI had not investigated at the time or because the Warren Commission had not investigated at the time, and now it's impossible to investigate. So nobody knows what Oswald did in that note. One side, I told you they split in two, uh, said that he threatened to bomb the FBI office, and the other said he threatened to bomb the police office. Uh, and that was one school of his threatening to bomb. And the other was uh, just a general threat if Hostie didn't leave his wife alone. I don't think it was either one of these things. I referred last night to the Rockefeller report and to David Bellin, you may remember, and he had served his, had, had his undergraduate training on the Warren Commission as a senior counsel. I told you last night about the re, uh, study that was made by the CIA and I told you it was being copied for you. Here it is. Uh, there's a covering letter. Uh, they've If you want to know how secret these people can be on last night's subject, those of you who are up in front can see that the top line says Memorandum 4, and the name is whited out. It was a memorandum for the man in the CIA who was going to deliver this to the Rockefeller Commission. There's no reason to keep that secret. And at the beginning, they say, There seems to be no reason to attach copies of these case reports from the file to the summary. There's no reason to give the Rockefeller Commission evidence. Let's just tell them what we think it so they should understand from it. And then there's a covering letter of May 30th, 1975 to Mr. David W. Bellin. And of course, the name of the man in the CIA has to be masked out. So that's the date. And then you have this, where you can see the masking and the word CIA written in under reference. And the subject is review of selected items in the Lee Harvey Oswald file. They don't care about the killing of a president. It's Lee Harvey Oswald file regarding allegations of Castro Cuban involvement in the John F. Kennedy assassination. Isn't it surprising that they didn't hear anything about these allegations of anti-Castro Cuban involvement? So. Uh, you then have this beginning on Saturday evening, 7th September 1963, Fidel Castro appeared at a brilliant embassy reception in Havana. Even more unusual, Castro submitted to an informal interview. And then they say where Harker's interview appeared and so forth. Uh, there was one summary paragraph that 
I skipped. I want to see if I can find it. This story by Mr. Harker achieved uh, quite a bit of attention, you may remember. And it said that Castro said he was going to uh, kill the President of the United States. Well, the CIA has that story in here, and it is possible when you get down into the story to interpret something that way. But here's the beginning of it. Fidel Castro said Saturday night U.S. leaders will be in danger if they helped in any attempt to do away with the leaders of Cuba. Bitterly denouncing what he called recent U.S.-prompted raids on Cuban territory, Castro said, we are prepared to fight them and answer in kind. Now, what Castro was talking about has since become fairly well known, uh, and that is that our government continued in efforts to overthrow the Cuban government. It was secret for many years from all of us, most of us anyway. But what this report is based upon, except for that, is what is in the Schweiker report. First, the CIA fed it uh, to the um, Rockefeller Commission, and when Bellin wasn't satisfied, didn't satisfy them completely, they gave it to the Schweiker Committee. And then the Schweiker Committee uh, went for it hook, line, and sinker. This, they really refer, I'm sorry I found, I haven't found the exact reference, and I don't want to take all the time looking for it. Um, they, re they really um, did a job on Schweiker. I may make a noise when I lay this microphone down. You may remember that, uh, if you didn't read the Schweiker report, last night I referred to uh, the masking of names by Senator Schweiker in his report, allegedly in the national interest. This was a matter of top uh, national security interest. There is a name in the Schweiker report D. It tells the story of uh, an alleged threat, an alleged payment of $6,500 to Lee Harvey Oswald in the Cuban embassy in the presence of a number of witnesses to kill John Kennedy. And you may remember I spoke about the involvement of Mr. Ford's Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Coleman and Mr. Slauson. The, here's one of their reports. Here is the one where they refer to the letter D. It comes fairly late in the Commission's life. It's a memorandum to J. Lee Rankin from Bert Griffin and Wesley J. Lieber. Bert Griffin is now a judge in Cleveland. Dated September 25, 1964. And they refer to certain pages of the draft of the report, which was then out. Uh, the Commission mentions that Oswald had made a previous trip to Mexico City in early September to receive money and orders from the assassination, footnote on page 567. This allegation in later, is later detailed in the Estatement of D, a page and a quarter discussion which is supported by footnote 578. Footnote, footnote 578 states to protect the portions of this case have been withheld. Uh, so you see, as of then, they were still protecting D, weren't they? Well, D was no secret. His name was Gilberto Gutierrez Alvarado Ugarte, and his name is here. Uh, in this report, uh, a draft of 1 April 1964, Coleman and Slauson on the subject, Pedro Gutierrez Valencia, they call him here. Uh, we do get confused with Latin names with all the metronymics. 
And he wrote a letter to President Johnson on this. That's how secret it was. FBI reports on this have never been withheld, and uh, I have quite a few of them. There, there is, you may remember, in the Schweiker report, a reference to a man who somehow, in great mystery, cost the Mexican border just at the time of the assassination in an equal mystery, uh, took a plane to Cuba. Well, his name is Gilberto uh, Cabarón. No, I'm sorry, that's the wrong name. That's a witness. Uh, Gilberto Lopez. Uh, and according to the non-secret report of the FBI, of an interview with Harvey Cash, the American consul at Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, they got everything about him, his passport number, his Mexican tourist number, uh, his statement of what his plans were. And there it is, the FBI report. They followed it up on December 4th uh, with more information on when Gilberto Lopez, American, 23 years of age, passport number, dated, and so forth. Yet, in the Schweiker report, now you can get this by writing a letter to the National Archives. You could before Senator Schweiker got interested in the Kennedy assassination, too. In the Schweiker report, he has to be secret in the interest of national security. There's another one. We won't take time to go into it. This one is Diaz, uh, Salvador Diaz Verson, also manufactured threats against John Kennedy, in which Lee Harvey Oswald was a participant in Mexico. I brought with me something I'll just mention uh, briefly. Uh, the newspapers, uh, they went ape about this. They played it straight, and they made on that all this stuff had been withheld from the Warren Commission. Another aspect of this, it's even more ridiculous. Uh, there's a story of a CIA secret agent whose code name was Amlash. Did any of you see any of the publicity on Amlash? There were two stories in the Washington Post, each of which was more than a page in length before the Schweiker report appeared, and they correctly identified Amlash as uh, one Rolando Cubella. And their story is, and the Schweiker story, without mentioning his right name is, that at the very moment John Kennedy was being killed, the CIA in Paris was giving Cubella a poison fountain pen with which to kill John Kennedy, and therefore this proves that Castro was retaliating. <laughs> uh, it's a big non sequitur, because obviously the man who was being induced to kill John Kennedy while he was being killed could not have been the man who killed him or the cause of retaliation. So after, after that name had been published countless millions of times, uh, Senator Schweiker still f listened to the CIA's siren song of urgent national security and suppressed the name. Uh, uh, perhaps the most terrible example of these is the one I mentioned last night. Remember I mentioned, uh, I'm just going to skim through this, but I want you to, I want you to know that, that these things I've told you about will be here and available to you. Remember I told you how the CIA conned Slauson and, and Coleman? Here's that report. You notice that blank space? Can you see the outlines of where they pasted a piece of paper on? And all they do is talk about their conference with the CIA on March 12th. And then the part that is masked is where they say, where they actually said Helms asked them to hold off. They also eliminated the subject matter. The subject matter was Nosenko. Now, remember I told you it wasn't secret. Well. Do you see any confidential stamps, restricted stamps, any low-grade classification on that? No. That's a letterhead memorandum from J. Edgar Hoover to the Warren Commission. Uh, I told you last night that there was a special branch of the English language that required certain dictionaries. This is how they classify the subject of the assassination of President John Kennedy. 
Lee Harvey Oswald, internal security, R standing for Russia, Cuba. Cuba. The following information was furnished on February 26, 27, 1964 to representatives of the FBI by Yuri Ivanovich Nosenko, Soviet defector, and then they masked some of it. Uh, and this, of course, you can see is a much thicker report. The FBI gave it a cover page, Statement of Yuri Ivanovich Nosenko. It's not top secret according to J. Edgar Hoover, is it? There's no stamp on it. And it goes on and on. And what Nosenko said is that the Russians always suspected Oswald was an American sleeper agent. If you like, we can take the time later and go through it and get the exact language for you. Now, of course, the Warren Commission told us all that uh, they're going to let the chips fall where, they, where it may. Now, they put a classification on it. You see that secret stamp down at the bottom? This is a page of the draft of part of their report. You see underneath my thumb, those of you who are closer, the word draft. I'm going to be reading this code, so if I stutter and go back, please excuse me. I, I haven't seen this for a while. Uh, some of the information furnished by the agency and most of its sources that, for that information are of a highly confidential nature. Nevertheless, because it believes that the fullest disclosure, possible disclosure of all the facts relating to the assassination of President Kennedy is of the highest importance. The Commission has included in this report all the information without exception which is considered, which it considered in coming to its conclusions whether such information tended to strengthen or weaken these conclusions. The only information which was not included in the report therefore was either wholly irrelevant to any of its conclusions or was derived from sources which are known to be unreliable and so forth. Does anybody have a copy of the Warren Report with them? I didn't bring mine. Well, take my word for it. It has an index. And if you look in the index, you will not find the name of Yuri Nosenko. But remember, they said they, they weren't leaving anything out. Without exception, I have an underline in red there. Nosenko was an exception. Protecting the CIA was not an exception. Uh, there are all sorts of goodies here. I'm just thumbing through it trying to see what else might be of interest. Uh, this is a page that was classified, and they finally got them to unclassify it. And the agent who unclassified it is 058375. They're way ahead of 007. Attached is Howard Willen's redraft of our foreign conspiracy draft. Well, of course, foreign conspiracy is where uh, this alleged business of Oswald and Castro, 6,500 bucks, and Ugarte and Verson and all these other strange characters belong. Who was the man who redrafted it? I mentioned his name last night, Howard Willens, a Department of Justice lawyer loaned to the Warren Commission. This is a bunch of documents I just forced the archives to give me. Um, so recently, I haven't had a chance to go over them. Uh, their covering letter is October 8th, but it took a little bit of time to get to me, and I've had, uh, I just had them copied here, so I haven't had a chance to refresh my mind. Here's another page. Here's another page, March 9, 1964, from W. David Slauson, subject testimony of Yuri Ivanovich Nosenko, recent Soviet defector. Here's an interesting part. According to Nosenko, Oswald's file contained, this is a direct quote, contained a statement from fellow hunters that Oswald was an extremely poor shot and that it was necessary for persons who accompanied him on hunts to provide him with game. That's true, and by the way, that was with a shotgun, not a rifle. Now, you can see some of you that until October they were holding from me two Statement of Gilberto Alvarado Ugarte, and they have written above it the Nicaraguan. He was a 23-year-old 
secret agent of Nicaraguan intelligence who tried to get the United States to attack Cuba and the CIA went for it. These are pages, by the way, that withheld from me uh, from this long memorandum before Willens rewrote it. It was 117 pages long. Now, oh, here's, I just saw Nosenko's name. Let me see if there's a goodie there. Now, I think instead of taking more time on this, uh, based on our experiences last night and the night before, where, our, in my opinion, the, the, the question period was in some ways more productive, uh, why don't I just say that I'm giving, conclude my remarks by saying I'm, I'm citing these only as examples. Uh, they're far from the complete story. Uh, the complete story is much more dangerous uh, to any concept of decent government than we, I've indicated and express the hope that you'll be on the alert for this and do whatever individuals can do to deter it because it's characteristic of all governments, not just ours, not just any administration. And while I put the rest of these papers together, perhaps somebody will have a question. Well, while you're trying to make it, do you have a question? Yes. Um, would you care to comment on uh, a book written by Hugh McDonald called Appointment in Dallas and something about it being written in support of the FBI? The question is very appropriate because it's another recent development. <clears throat> the presses are disgorging all sorts of fake books. McDonald's is the most successful because McDonald's is one of the most proficient con men. Uh, fortunately, I have had little experience with con men outside the federal government. They're a different kind. Uh, McDonald served quite an apprenticeship. He rose to be one of the top men, if not the second man, in the entire Los Angeles County, California Sheriff's Department. He says he had 600 sergeants alone working under him. I had meetings with McDonald when a publisher who was considering doing the book in hardback hired me as a consultant. In the course of this, I, I knew something about the publisher. I'd never met him. His lawyer was a friend of mine. And because of this lawyer fearing what could happen to his friend, the publisher, who the government did not like, he had published things that didn't approve of the CIA, for example, which made him a dangerous character. And my lawyer friend was afraid of be being entrapped. I felt the same way. And I had to conduct an investigation of McDonald's books. Now, you remember this book says it's based on a confession McDonald personally took, and McDonald is this very brave man, braver than anybody else in the whole world, uh, from a, an assassin named Saul and that he recognized this assassin saw because he's seen his picture in the newspaper and this is perhaps as high a tribute to McDonald as anybody can pay because that picture never appeared in the newspaper. Well, the three different versions of the one confession and the thing that blew it with the original publisher was when I told him to ask McDonald to produce his original handwritten verbatim account of Saul's so-called confession. I'm going to tell you why. Because McDonald said that he had a meeting that lasted two hours, and in these two hours, with his own right hand, he wrote 10,000 words. The book is that careless a fake. Uh, in the different versions of the book, uh, this dangerous character, Saul, who kills on whim, but always for money, uh, confessed to McDonald in the lobbies of two different hotels in two different countries. And finally, McDonald thought it would sound better in his own room in a third country. So it became a confession in McDonald's hotel room in England and wasn't Canada or Switzerland anymore. But it's all one confession and you understand it's real. Uh, the funniest part was eliminated after the book was on the press. <clears throat> Another publication, this time a popular publication, which was considering and in fact had offered 
uh, $25,000 for the serial right to McDonald's book. They had some doubts, so they asked me. I just referred them to one part of McDonald's book, uh, and it broke them up, and it broke up the deal. And McDonald's book, you may remember, now I, I could speak for two days on McDonald's book, all on fact. I'm just going to give you some illustrations. Uh, you may remember that he has his assassin lurking in a building he never managed to name until I asked him, was it such and such a building, the records building? And then on the last version, records building was added. He has this man lurking in wait for 55 minutes knowing that the president wasn't due to get there for 55 minutes and no president's ever ahead of time in a motorcade uh, to, kill John Ke to uh, kill John Kennedy. Now this is a public building and naturally an assassin wanted to have a perfectly safe, safe place, wouldn't you think so? Wouldn't you think he'd want that? Well now put yourself, of course you lack his experiences, uh, it, it's a little bit different once you look down the sight of a gun and killed people, and this man had a career of doing it, so they, he's used to blood and you're not, and he's used to death and you're not. But nonetheless, put yourself in his place, and you want to get away from there, you want to be safe. You want to earn your money, in this case, only 50,000 bucks, and, and, that, and that's nothing, or maybe it was 25, which is less. Uh, not enough to hire a lawyer with, if you get caught. Where would you find, what would you find if you had a whole public building uh, from which to pick the assassin's lair, what would you find the safest place? Now I want to see if you got the benefit of the college education you're getting here. What would be the safest place? The roof. No, not the roof. Oh well, let's not waste any time. It was a ladies' room. Seriously. McDonald had Saul lurking in the ladies' room on the second floor of the records building, which is a public building. It's the county records building, uh, waiting for uh, the, to kill the president, and he's supposed to kill Oswald. That was because he picked a place from which he couldn't even see Oswald. So naturally, he was going to kill him there. This tells you how much of an investigation McDonald made. Well, it's even worse than that, because there is no ladies' room there. It's a judge's office. So when the publication asked him about that, if you look at McDonald's book and come to that place, you will find at the end of a paragraph three dots. The book had been printed when, they, when their deal for the ancillary uh, rights fell through and the publisher all of a sudden said, my God, and they just changed that one line of type, eliminating everything after it, put in three dots and cut the rest of it out and then resumed with something else. Uh, is that enough of McDonald's book? I can tell you a lot more. That book sold over a million copies. It's the only book I know that has two publishers on facing pages. On the left-hand page, it says that Hugh McDonald is the publisher, and on the right-hand page, it says that Zebra is the publisher. Well, I guess if you're going to have to have something like that, it couldn't be better than Zebra with all those stripes, could it? <laughs> Another question? You people have to warm up a little bit. So let me tell you another Nosenko story. What Nosenko said was not welcome. I think you're aware of that. So let me tell you what happened to Nosenko, who had defected from the KGB and was, of course, a prize for the CIA. They rewarded him once he told them that the Russians thought Oswald was their guy. They took him down to a secret installation of theirs, Camp Perry, spelled P-E-A-R-Y, Virginia. Uh, down along James River, as I remember, not too far from Richmond. And they, he was a prisoner in solitary for three very abusive years. He has finally uh, been paid off in full by the CIA. They've let him out of solitary. They've given him a new identity and he's someplace in the United States. This is really what happened to Yuri Nosenko when he dared risk his life to tell the truth when he defected from the Soviet Union.
The light's in my eye, so if you raise your hand with a question, uh, wave it if I don't see it. Yes, sir. Uh, I think it was on Good Night America where they had Frank Sturgis on, and he claimed that you know he was working for the government during this time, and he had been in Cuba, and he had heard of a meeting between Castro and all these people. And I was just wondering what kind of credibility uh, Frank Sturgis has during this period. This kind of thing for which I find the question and answer period uh, so valuable, because Frank Sturgis, uh, and that is his right name, he was born Frank Fiorini, but his mother remarried, and he uses both names, has made himself uh, uh, quite a, a character in the news, not only by being caught in the Watergate, by, but by the publicity of this sort that he's attracted to himself. He is one of the people who immediately John Kennedy was killed, started a whole campaign about Lee Harvey Oswald meeting with Castro Ike Cubans. The question has to do with Sturgis's credibility, and there is none. There is no question about the fact that he's been a soldier of fortune type all of his life. He's also a racketeer. He's got a number of rackets incorporated in Florida. He was arrested in a hot car racket uh, of taking hot cars to Mexico. His companion in that was named Buchanan. And believe it or not, that's the same Buchanan, who was a, a reporter for the Fort Lauderdale Sun-Times, as I remember it, who was involved in the original baloney story made up to complicate the life of the FBI and to blame the assassination on Castro. Now, there's one thing of which I am reasonably certain about Frank Sturgis, and he is so pathological a liar, I doubt if he knows the truth. Uh, you know, he's got more romantic stories than yours. How about the chick who was sleeping with Castro he gave poison to, and with all this stuff the CIA taught him, he had her put the poison in her cold cream where the capsule dissolved, and therefore she couldn't use it. Uh, he, I think that, Cas that uh, uh, Sturgis was the commissar of gambling in Cuba. And he had to leave Cuba because he was running a racket with that. And he was carrying all kind of chicks around with him, driving around in limousines, smoking long cars, and blackmailing the casino operators. Um, he blackmailed them in Cuban pesos, but he lost all that money when Castro changed the currency. Sturgis is a, a would-be storybook character. Now, the second part of the question had to do with Jack Ruby. Let me amplify that story, because this story is that um, it happened in jail when uh, Santos Traficante was in jail, having been arrested by Castro. Traficante, the mafia boss who centered it, father and son, same name, centered at Tampa, Florida. They had, op had big operators in gambling. Well, the story came originally, not from Sturgis, but from a British reporter uh, whose name, as I remember, it was Hudson. And in the CIA papers that are being copied now, you're going to find that when the CIA did some checking on this story, uh, their report of an investigation from London, included in a cable that's in the file you're going to have, uh, says he's a thoroughly undependable character, a psychopath with a desire for vengeance against Castro because Castro had thrown him in jail. If you know anything at all about Jack Ruby, there's one thing you can be certain of that nobody high in the mob ever had anything to do with him. Ruby was a punk who aspired to be a hood and couldn't quite make it. I have other ways, of, however, of knowing about this. Years before any of this surfaced, and really it's fabrications and embellishments, uh, I spent days interviewing one of the mysterious characters of the soldier of fortune types who's injected himself into this. His name is uh, Lorraine Hall. He is referred to in the Warren Report uh, in where they consider the possibilities of conspiracy and say they all add up to nothing. And I have all of my interviews with Hall on tape, and it's not a clandestine tape. He had the microphone lying on his chest. He was in a veterans hospital in Los Angeles that was recently destroyed by an earthquake. Hall was in prison with Santos Traficante. And there's one thing you can be sure of. If Jack Ruby had ever walked into that jail 
Lorraine Hall, whose greatest ambition was to be on the front page of the National Enquirer, would not have failed to tell me. In the book, uh, you know, they murdered the president and the title of it. And he makes a lot about this connection between uh, the mob and uh, the gambling in Cuba. And then I think he connects Ruby in there. Would you kind of discount that then? Totally. But I'll give you a, a sidelight on Anson. And I'll be surprised if Dr. Roan doesn't speak more of Anson later today. Anson's with New Times. And he called me up. And I tried to interest New Times when nobody else had it in the uh, January 22nd transcript that I read from last night. Remember, I'd given it away to the papers and they didn't, wouldn't use it. And uh, it, it interested him. He said, you got to come and see me. And he said, by the way, I believe this was before he did a book. He said, I believe the mob did Kennedy and what do you think? And I said, I think it's improbable. I think you'll never prove it if it is the truth. And if you really want to investigate, why don't you follow some of the lively leads? He said, well, this is better copy. He said, I got to come down to Washington to speak to people in the Department of Justice next week to get some help out of come and see. I said, fine. Well, we spoke again after he spent six weeks on that. And in six weeks, he got nothing, absolutely nothing. And the reason he got nothing is because it doesn't exist. However, he was so enamored of the commercial possibilities of this that he centers his book, that is the parts that he doesn't take from other people, and they're not all credited in footnotes by any means, uh, on this. But there's, there's not only no proof of it, there's less reason to believe that than there is to believe many other possibilities. But there is no evidence of it. It is improbable. And it is entirely inconsistent with the history of the mob. They just don't operate that way. Another question? Yes. Well, the one in back first, please. I can see you easier. Well, I forgot on the same subject. Uh, I never did get to see that program. Uh, my TV just cut out where it was. But did they ever come up with any definitive proof of a connection between Ruby and Oswald? It was on the same show. I they never. Uh, this uh, is an area of longing, uh, it's an area of mythology, and uh, I've been un unfortunate enough to be involved in some of this sordid stuff, but uh, there's, there is one legitimate basis for an honest misunderstanding, uh, and this has recently surfaced again uh, in the tabloids but it's all in the Warren Commission, 26 volumes. There was a guy who you could say, by stretching your imagination, suggested Lee Harvey Oswald, who got involved in some kind of a, a minor thing at Ruby's place. And uh, there were pictures of it. And the pictures make it very clear it couldn't be Oswald. And the pictures are published in the 26 volumes. I've forgotten his name. I think it's Anderson or something like that. Uh, but in any event, that's the closest thing to a connection. Now, Ruby was a, a, a really sick man, sick in the head, uh, before all of this happened. Nobody in his right mind would have trusted Ruby with a time of day. He was a, a, another character who longed to be what he couldn't be. Uh, he was unpredictable, violence-prone. Uh, I'll give you one of the stories that, again, Mark Lane and Jim Garrison were working on. There's a character named Dago Garner. Uh, he was arrested for having shot a Warren Commission uh, witness before he was a Warren Commission witness named Warren Reynolds. Warren Reynolds operated the used car a lot, a block away from where Officer J.D. Tippett was killed. He saw the man who had been seen to shoot at Tippett uh, running away without running too hard, and he said it was not Lee Harvey Oswald. And thereupon, he alone, of all these people, the rest of them having said it, what could be interpreted as, as meaning a kind of identification of Oswald, Warren Reynolds alone was shot. In connection with this, Dago Garner was arrested. Uh, he was let go. There was no proof. And he immediately became a famous man. So Lane and Garrison interviewed him, and uh, I happened by accident to hear both Garrison's tape and to see the rushes of a movie that Mark Lane never finished, in which he was interviewing Dago Garner going over the same jump Garrison had. 
and Garner was giving great personal detail about his homosexual relationships with both Oswald and Ruby. None of it's true. Garrison was going to release it to the press in Los Angeles in November 67, and it was, we had a meeting in the New Century Hotel where he'd been a speaker, and I talked him out of it, fortunately. Then Garner died, and I happened to see Garrison right after it happened. He said, you see, they killed him. I said, who? He said, Dago. He said, Dago was an important witness, and they killed him. I said, how'd they kill him? Well, he said, they say it was an overdose of heroin, but he said, you know, you know damn well they did it to him. And th this is the way these stories proliferate. All sorts of people hear these stories, they embellish them. I know of no basis for believing it. Now, there, are bases, there is reason to believe that they could have seen each other and things like that. For example, they're both known to have drunk coffee in the same cafe. They live in the same neighborhood. One of the most provocative things of all is that when Oswald supposedly left his rooming house to go to his rendezvous to kill Tippett, he walked very close to the Ruby place. Nobody knows where he went. He could even have gone to Ruby's place. I don't know what happened. I'm only telling you that the evidence says no. I get back to what we talked about last night. There never was a real investigation. Shouldn't this have been investigated carefully? If on no other basis that Oswald's proximity in the commission's own story to Ruby's home, when Ruby killed Oswald in particular. Another question? Oh, you had one in front of you, George. Yeah, um, on the tube I've seen uh, Jack Anderson uh, state that uh, Frank Sturgis was a reliable source and that he had used him in the past. Uh, on the basis of what you said about Sturgis, would you comment on that? Well, he was a source for Jack Anderson, and I have personal knowledge of two. Remember I told you that I thought that uh, Sturgis was the commissar of gambling? That's based on a story that Jack Anderson wrote with Drew Pearson before Drew Pearson died. Uh, that appeared, as I remember it, in... Well, I'm really not sure of the publication, but it was a large... Uh, circulation publication. I think it was something like Parade, but it could have been a magazine. At the time of the Watergate, because of this pr uh, previous connection between the two, Sturgis had Anderson in a closet over in the Virginia side of the Potomac River near Washington to listen in on conversations. Uh, we've been doing a little bit of debunking. Let me add a personal note. And it's not for personal reasons, but it's to uh, go into the overtones of George's question and uh, the implications of it, and to try and give you an understanding of more of the realities of the state of our institutions, and I regard the press as one of the most important institutions in a country like ours. I told you earlier I was hospitalized with thrombophlebitis phlebitis a year ago last month. And on a Sunday, Les Whitten, who's a friend of mine, came to see me, and he got emotional. He, he called me first. He wanted to ask me about something, and I was able to help him. I'll tell you what that is right off the bat. Somebody had leaked an FBI report having to do with the assassination of John Kennedy in an interview with Governor Conley, when Governor Conley, you may remember he was wounded, had returned to Austin from the Dallas hospital. And I looked at it, and I told Les that was not a Warren Commission copy, and told him who to call, gave him the telephone number, and told him what to ask him, and what to ask for, told him how he'd get it, to compare the two, and he'd probably find out it was a back channel. And he did, and there was a column on that. The two reports are, are different, basically different, on what Governor Conley said he saw immediately. The report that went to the Warren Commission has one version. The back channel report has another version. And as I remember the differences, what Governor Conley really said is that when he heard the first shot and turned to his right, remember, this is his story, and he's always said it from the very beginning, he heard a shot, and he turned to the right as far as he could. What the Warren, what the FBI's report that went to the Warren Commission says is that he saw the Texas School Book Depository Building, where actually the FBI said the lone assassin Oswald was in the sixth floor window. What the back channel report from Austin says is, is that Governor Conley said that when he turned around, he saw three buildings. Big difference, isn't there? 
not just the Texas School Book Depository building, but two that require that he turn farther. So to come back to uh, the point on Les and the Anderson column, and what I'm really talking about, modern investigative reporting, Les was a little bit emotional. He said, Hal, you're the last of a dying breed. I said, what kind of malarkey are you giving me? He said, nope. He said, there is no such thing as investigative reporting anymore. We all depend on leaks. We're all so busy, we have no choice. I said, come on, unless you've written some great stuff in the past 10 years that I know about. He said, not investigative reporting, leaks. So they depend on people, including undependable people, like Frank Sturgis. Without people leaking to them, they're not in business. People who leak have a personal interest to serve, almost without exception. You find, of course, many leaks where people's personal interest coincides with what they regard as a national interest, and often it does serve the national interest. I regard, for example, Daniel Ellsberg as having served the national interest. Uh, not personal interest, but his personal interest was in seeing to it that the story came out. So, yes, uh, Frank Fiorini Sturgis had been a long time informer for Jack Anderson, going back to before Jack Anderson owned the column to when Drew Pearson had it. I think that when I came to George, somebody in back had a question, am I right? Yes. Another interview, going back to Mr. Ruby for a minute, talking about conflicting stories giving rise to rumors. His death in the, in the Parkland Hospital from cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, they keep implying that the, the Dallas jailers knew he was ill and thought he was faking before, prior to the cancer being detected and everything else. That implies that he had some cancer cells or something along those lines. I wonder if he was able to at all. I can't give you a definitive answer to that question. But if you don't mind, I'll tell you a personal story. And I'm doing, telling you this personal story uh, so you'll know how I got it and so you can have your own evaluation of the source. The source is a person with whom I agree about very little. He's a prestigious Chicago lawyer named Elmer Gertz. Uh, I was asked to do a TV show on WBBM Chicago uh, the Madigan Show was taped on a Friday and aired on a Sunday. And Elmer Jenner, who recently achieved some fame as uh, Watergate Impeachment Committee uh, Assistant Counsel, you may remember. Elmer Jenner had been a Warren Commission a Senior Counsel. Uh, this was on January 7th. Jenner had agreed to appear on the program, and then they asked me, and I agreed. And then after I agreed, Jenner all of a sudden remembered he had a Christmas party on January 7th. And he therefore couldn't be there. And Elmer Gertz was his replacement. Well, there were two unusual things happened that day. One was a blizzard. And the other was some technical troubles in the studio. So when I got there, they said, you know, we're having some problems with the studio. We're running behind on our taping. Why don't you leave your stuff here and let us take you down uh, to the cafeteria? So they took me down to the cafeteria, and lo, there was Elmer Gertz and his wife, and we were introduced. And we spent over an hour talking to each other before they were ready to tape. Elmer told me he had just come from Jack Ruby's funeral. That was the day Jack Ruby was buried. It was in the papers that day. It was real. And we got talking about it. Now, here's what Elmer told me. And he is my source. He is my only source. He said, I went down to see Jack. And if you read his book, you know he developed an affection for Jack. Uh, and he said, I picked up Eva, and we went to the, sea, the, to the jail to see Jack, and we were shocked. He looked like hell. We had never seen him look like that. And he said, we insisted that he be examined. And we spoke to Jack, and Jack said a doctor had seen him and told him he had a cold and gave him something like aspirin. And he said, we insisted that he be taken to the hospital, and he was taken to the hospital. And he said it was too late. And he said, I'm just as satisfied as I can be that if Herman uh, Decker, the sheriff Decker, uh, hadn't been in the hospital himself, he would have seen to it that Jack got prompt care. Well, now, that's an ambiguity. If Jack had gotten care two weeks earlier 
for an incurable cancer, what difference would it have made? So one way of looking at what Elmer Gritch told me is that he was implying he had suspicions. He said nothing, absolutely nothing of a specific nature that would lead to this belief. Nonetheless, that ambiguity can be interpreted that way. I don't think he meant it that way. I think he meant merely that Jack would have been put in the hospital two weeks earlier because he looked so bad and not merely been treated for a cold. But I don't think that for all of the things the spooks do about getting rid of people, <clears throat> they have yet successfully transplanted human cancer. I have heard of the successful experimental injection of animal cancers. Is there another question? Yes. Is it true that uh, Jack Ruby, before the Warren Commission, made the comment that they should get him out of Dallas, Dallas Texas, uh, that he was under a threat? Would, would that be in any way connected, or is that just Jack Ruby uh, talking that way? I, the, the, it is correct that it was Jack Ruby was just talking that way, but remember I told you he had irreversible brain damage. Uh, he was le legitimately a crazy man. <clears throat> I don't know of anything, I'm going to, if I don't, if I forget to tell you a personal story, uh, let me tell you one after this. I don't know anything any person wanted to tell the Warren Commission that that person could not have told the Warren Commission whether or not it had been listened to. I don't know any one thing that would have made Jack Ruby safer in Washington than in Dallas. And you can measure Ruby and his sincerity in this. Not, not his sincerity, because he was crazy and he didn't know uh, how reasonable it was by what really happened. They wanted to um, give Ruby a polygraph. That was the idea of David Bellin. He told me all about it when we debated at Vanderbilt University last year. Uh, he insisted that Ruby be given a polygraph. It was none of his business. It wasn't his part of the work, but he insisted on it. So they agreed. And Ruby's lawyers objected to it, as lawyers should have objected to it. Who do you think Ruby turned to for advice on whether or not he should take a polygraph examination? Assistant Tech, uh, Dallas District Attorney Bill Alexander. So naturally, Alexander wanted him to take a polygraph. Alexander was his prosecutor. L really, literally, not just on the prosecution staff, he was prosecuting Ruby in court. Now, what kind of judgment does this reflect of Jack Ruby? The personal story I wanted to tell you is, uh, unfortunately, the man's now dead. He was the chief criminal deputy of Dallas County, Sweat, Alan Sweat, S-W-E-A-T-T. -T. Alan Sweat was never a witness before the Warren Commission. There is no FBI report of an interview with Alan Sweat, and I'm going to tell you why. Alan Sweat, as Chief Criminal Deputy Sheriff, whose office was closest of all official offices to the scene of the crime, interviewed and took an affidavit from every witness to the scene of the crime who immediately surfaced. They just poured him into Sweat's office. There wasn't time for lengthy affidavits, most of them were only a paragraph long. All of the pictures taken at the scene of the crime that were immediately known, Alan Sweat got and developed. Now, can you think of a better reason for him never being a Warren Commission witness or not being interviewed by the FBI? It's unreal, but that's the reality. Alan Sweat happened to be the Dallas police polygraph expert, and he had a polygraph room. Arlen Specter, who was the most active of the Warren Commission counsel, he was in charge mostly of the medical evidence, but he, he got around quite a bit. Uh, he was in on this uh, um, polygraph. The FBI did not believe in polygraphs, and according to what Alan told me, they gave two agents two weeks of training and thereby be made them polygraph experts, and they sent them down to conduct the polygraph examination. Alan Sweat was only the chief criminal deputy sheriff, so Arlen Specter insisted that Sweat not be in the room when Ruby uh, be examined. And Sweat told me that he turned to Spectre, and when he left, he said, when I leave, 
anybody who knows anything about this goddamn machine is leaving too. That was Alan Sweat's opinion of the polygraph examination, quite aside from whether or not you have faith in polygraphs. But uh, I'm trying also with this to give you a picture of the way these agencies function. Uh, it was really an unusual thing not to use an authentic expert on polygraphs if they wanted a meaningful polygraph examination. Yes? Along those same lines, uh, <coughs> Mr. O'Toole, what did you not mention uh, one witness, I think, uh, you, Ashley Frazier, I believe, he was supposed to be given a polygraph too, taken back to court uh, that evening, and they explained they never took it. They <coughs> had a whole big hoorah going on about that. Well, I mean, I wonder if Mr. Sweat would have been the guy that given that one. Fraser was given a polygraph examination. I don't have much confidence in Mr. O'Toole's book. I know too much about it, Mr. O'Toole. Um, however, I also know about the Fraser polygraph. It was for an entirely different purpose. Buell Wesley Fraser was taken in that night, and what the police wanted to know is was he laying Marina Oswald? He said he was, and the polygraph proved him right. Is there another question? Yes. Would you mind starting again, please? I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, I could only hear that you were asking about political interest. Can somebody heard the question repeated, please? Hmm? Uh, it's, it's difficult for me to address your question in the sense in which you ask it, because you are implying personal gain. And I don't think that in any of the official involvements in the cover-up, there was a question of personal gain, except in a limited sense with J. Edgar Hoover, who had created this mystique that he is the man who could solve any and every crime and in fact had always solved them. Outside of that, I don't think there was such a factor. Let me break it down in these ways. First, there was benefit to the FBI and the Secret Service in several ways. It was their obligation to keep the president alive and they had failed. It therefore became their obligation to, so to solve the crime and by the cover-up they made it appear that they had. Last night, we went into the political, uh, really horrible political situation faced by the government, all the worries they had to consider, uh, and their perceived need to cover it up to restore uh, tranquility and peace to the country, to settle the people's emotions, to uh, effectuate a smooth continuity from one administration to another, things of that sort. So in this sense, as these people perceived their obligation and the national need, there was a benefit. But except for the assassins who I don't know, and I'm sure that anybody tells you he knows, lies to you when he says it, uh, I don't know any benefit. I don't think that it was done that way. I don't think it had that in mind. I think it was the way bureaucracies, all bureaucracies work under these conditions. And I've tried to give you some uh, reasonable explanations of why bureaucracies do work that way. I do think it was an important consideration to uh, have a smooth transition uh, from the Kennedy administration to the Johnson administration, to give you one example. I do think that people in Washington should have wondered, only for a short while, of course, but should have wondered, uh, was there going to be other violence? Was there going to be an attack from abroad? Uh, was this the signal for an internal revolution? These are the things most of us don't think about, but it is the obligation of government to think about them. Can you follow me on that? So we have several stages of the cover-up and of the need. Uh, at the beginning, there was one kind of need. Thereafter, there was another kind of need. But I really don't think that we can consider this responsibly in terms of anyone's personal interest. Yes? In other words, you would say that no agency of the government actually was involved in the killing per se, but in the cover-up, they each had a benefit. That's, that's putting it well. Uh, I, I 
know of no proof that any agency of the federal government was involved in any political assassination, not just John Kennedy's. But of course they did have these interests in the cover-up. Yes. Were you asking a question or moving your hair? Okay. Mr. Yes. Uh, what type of effort do you believe is necessary to get a full and responsible investigation of the cover-up? Well, I think, I think that... Go ahead. Uh, what form should it take? What we have pending now is what I asked for in the conclusion of my first book, A Congressional Investigation. We have problems with them, as we've seen this morning in our consideration of the Schweiker report and of the Don Edwards investigation and of the Abzug investigation. The choices are limited. We've had enough consideration, I think, of presidential commissions to ignore them and consider them not reasonable alternatives. We're then left to the workings of the system of justice and to Congress. There has to be a question that can properly go before a court before there can be a question before a court. As of now, there's no prospect of any criminal case going before a court. So, as of now, what is relevant that is before the courts is what Jim Lassar has before three federal courts in Washington right now uh, with me as his client. I do think that if we ever get the evidence we are seeking and can receive any attention for it, that will at least have the effect of ending this long agony of doubt, of disbelief, and a lack of faith in the official solution to the crime. What we can expect of the House Committee is uncertain, and I don't want to mislead you on that. And as I said last night, the one thing that we can do is, as each of us can see ways of doing it, try and keep pressure on them to keep them responsible. These are people and as I always do, I want to try and show you another side so you can be appreciative of the position in which they are. These are people who begin with prior experiences of many kinds. Mr. Sprague, for example, has a spectacular record as a prosecutor, but they know nothing about this subject. And it is an enormously complicated subject, made more complicated by the federal agencies whose purpose was to make it complicated, merely to hide things and to make it impossible for anybody to follow leads. So they inherit not only all of that, but everything that is being flooded upon them by every expert, real, self-appointed, imaginary, or non-existent. And I can't begin to estimate the number of authentic paranoids who've been there. All of them experts, all of them giving them all this great work of theirs. Uh, and they've got a tough job. They've got a tough job just weeding this kind of thing out. Then you've got another problem. Uh, members of House committees are congressmen who are of all different varieties. You've got stamen apples, and you've got delicious apples, and, uh, and you've got tall people, and you've got short people, you've got liberals, you've got conservatives. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples. There was a black member who went for a palpably false story, and without his doing that, there wouldn't have been this investigation. That's one extreme. He's a liberal. On the other end, uh, you have a congressman from Ohio, Ohio whose name is Devine. And I have every confidence that before too long you're going to be hearing more about Mr. Devine because he figures as a member of the House of Representatives who was a friend of Gerald Ford's. In my civil action, 75, 14, 48 in the Federal District Court of Washington. Now we have a hearing on the 18th on it. Mr. Devine is a Joe McCarthy type and he cast Mr. Ford in that role. He, however, is also an experienced investigator, having served his apprenticeship as an FBI investigator before.
The problem with them is that they are so voluminous that the human mind can't encompass them and the average pocketbook can't pay for them. Uh, as I was saying last night, and as I suggested earlier today, uh, the sheer volume created, the volume of irrelevancies, and I gave you Oswald's pubic hair as a more spectacular illustration, uh, in itself becomes a means of denying accents, access and of obfuscating everything. The uh, D stuff is another example of that, and that really is what I had in mind for this morning. Uh, it was, it was, there was no truth to it. It was an effort to use the Kennedy assassination for another political objective. It was never investigated. I've shown you the staff papers of the Warren Commission. They knew all about it. I've only shown you some. There were a lot more. They did nothing about it, and they had no interest in why would anyone try and make this misuse of the Kennedy assassination? I think it's a valuable thing for the people to know that that happened. But I don't think it's going to help us know who killed John Kennedy, and I use this as an illustration of the distinction. Uh, have I answered what you had in mind? Thanks. These are good questions. I hope people have some more. Yes? On that same subject of evidence, some of the medical experts that have been called by some of the critics and others to get into the medical evidence, which I believe is still, some parts of it are still forbidden to the general public anyway, probably on the, the grounds of how gross they would be or how, how something. I understand that material would probably throw some light on the competent medical personnel to look at it, because even from the beginning of the investigation, uh, like the doctors who testified, were even allowed to look at their own photos? Well, I, I think that's very reasonable. I also think we come to the point where most of the possibility no longer exists. Uh, I've been trying to get that stuff since 1966, and when I didn't, uh, you know, sometimes if, if you lock the front door, you may find the back door unlocked. So I've done an enormous investigation, and I have obtained a very large number of formerly secret relevant medical records and you'll find a large number of them reproduced in the appendix of post-mortem in facsimile. That's the green book on the table. You will find, for example, the death certificate that the Warren Commission neither had nor wanted. You'll find an expert reading of all of the autopsy film made in secret for the Department of Justice by top radiologists and pathologists. They practiced a special form of semantics, but there is no question about it. They destroy the entire Warren report. Uh, yes, I think that competent people should have access to the medical evidence that is still withheld. No, I do not believe it will lead to any kind of a breakthrough. And I do not believe it should go into general circulation. I, I do not think that uh, it's the kind of thing that should be in the National Enquirer, for example. And if it's in the New York Times, it's going to be in the National Enquirer. I think that these things are, are not uh, subject to explicit statements and that we have to use our own judgments and do have to recognize that there are questions of taste and other factors that have to be considered. Another question? Yes. Well, you have the right names. Uh, the urologist you did not mention is John Latimer. Uh, I would be happier if I could tell you he was a bologna slicer. He's a bullet slicer. His idea of proof is to take a bullet and take it into a laboratory and slice it with laboratory machinery as finely as possible and to say, look, this bullet could have left fragments in the bodies of John Kennedy and, and um, John Conley. That doesn't make any difference, does it? That's kind of scientific work he does. The one part of uh, the president's body of which there have been no reports of a deficiency was the urogenital system. Uh, Latimer 
is not an expert. Vladimir is a political partisan. He's hung up on assassinations. And the craziest thing I've ever read in my life is his supposedly scholarly work on the Lincoln assassination. He's an anti-Semite, and he can't even hide it in his writing on the uh, John Kennedy assassination, which is nonsense. None of it stacks. Cyril Wecht had access to everything Latimer had access to. Uh, he was denied nothing that Latimer saw. He came out unable to say anything about it, so he said other things. I think the veterinarian you're re referring to is Dr. Olivier. He did not have access to that information. He had access to other information in an earlier day when he was on the staff at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds uh, in Maryland, not too far from where I live, north of Baltimore, where the Chemical Warfare Service has its major base and where they do a lot of experimental work with ballistics and things of that sort. He is one of those who conducted some of the ballistics tests for the Warren Commission, and no matter how they improved the rifle and did everything else they did to try and make it appear possible, they were never able to duplicate even the penetrating power attributed to that bullet. Now, Dr. Latimer talks about how many pine boards it can go through, and you may choose to be impressed, but I don't think John Kennedy was made out of pine boards. And when they tried to duplicate one bullet going through John Kennedy's neck, John Conley's chest, wrist, and lodging in the thigh, Dr. Olivier could not do it he did not do it. When CBS tried to do it for their 1967 special, they could not do it, and they did not do it. Nobody's ever done it. Now, this is the kind of problem you run into when so-called experts, who really don't know a damn thing about the subject, go off into uh, fairies and needle science. How many inches of pine board a bullet can go through it doesn't really make any difference. When they tried to do it with human tissue and the substitute for human tissue that is normal, they could not do it. CBS used masonite as a substitute for bone, and there's nothing wrong with that I know of with that. But they left the masonite out when it came to the biggest bone, most of which was hit. John Conley's rib. Even then they couldn't duplicate it. This is the kind of problem we get into with experts, who are not experts, except in a narrow sense. There's a big difference between having a forensic pathologist give testimony on a homicide where he has a chance to see the cadaver, where the courts see to it that all the junk that was dumped on the Warren Commission does not exist to confuse and mislead him. He's restricted by the rules of evidence to what is material. His mind doesn't get confused. Uh, by all of these other things. For example, Cyril once said that he, after he saw the autopsy material, he knew that the Cubans had done it. They have a story in the National Enquirer. I hope I've given you an answer. It's not an easy one to answer.